just I would really want to ask you this question. How many of you have heard that there are prophecies out that YWAM is supposed to grow fast and to have up to 200,000 missionaries? How many have heard this ever? A few in around here. I've heard it from many sources. I've had letters and so on, and people not talking to each other saying this. Now, whenever we get prophecies, one, we have to take them before the Lord, because if it involves us, you know, you don't want prophets coming up and saying to you, a single young people, uh, you're supposed to marry her. Well, the prophet's not going to have to marry her. You better find out from God if that's right. Because <laughs> you're the one that's going to live a long time. <laughs> and so if it's right, it's right, and then that's fine. But uh, so we took it to the Lord in our leadership uh, worldwide. And uh, in, in taking that before the Lord, the Lord showed us there were many uh, areas in which it was not, it's going to happen. It's something that God is wanting to explode missions, not just YWAM. And uh, we begin to meet after that with the uh, fathers of the house church movement. There are six fathers. And that's more than 100, 000, 100 million uh, people that are, are belong to one of those six uh, fathers. And they came to Conan. They spent um, one of them up to three months with us and others just uh, for a week or so discussing how they could send out one million missionaries from China. And one of the things that comes up is money. How do you support missions? And I love to tell the story how the first American missionary... He wanted to go to Burma. He had a burning desire for a place called Burma, now called Myanmar. And as he went around everywhere, and but no one, because they'd gone through two wars at that time, this is the 1800s, and they didn't have any money. And they all said so. We don't have any money. So he got a free trip uh, by a captain, Christian captain, took him over to London. And he went to the people there and asked the leaders that were uh, behind mission movements at that time. He said, can you help me get to Burma? And they said, sure, become a British citizen and we'll send you to Burma. He said, no, God wants me to go as an American missionary. He said, they said, well, go back to America then. <laughs> but something happened when the people caught on that they don't have to raise all of the funds. They just needed to give what they could. And they started penny marches. After they took their uh, regular offering each Sunday, and a lot of that took care of their church and their pastor and so on, then at the end they would all come up with any pennies they had and drop it in. And the pennies actually sent out our first missionary. When I was a kid, and of course, Leland, he can remember even before that. <laughs> he threw rocks at me. Anyway, <laughs> I get things backwards. I'm 38 years old. And uh, so anyway, even as a kid, we had our penny marches during the Depression. And that's how we kept missions going. We didn't say we don't have money because you always at least could get a penny for Sunday. If nothing else, you could find it in the street. And so that's what we need to recognize because everywhere YWAM goes, we should be starting not just a YWAM base, but a mission movement out of that nation because they, they have the same Bible as we have. In 1961, I was ministering out in, in Nigeria, West Africa, teaching. And uh, 
in a, in a Bible school. And, and I was taking the place of a missionary until he, he got there. He's raising his penny marches. And, uh, and so I was speaking to a couple of hundred young people, and I told them, you too can be a missionary. And I began to challenge them and so on. And afterwards, one of the older missionaries came to me and he said, Lauren, you can't do that. And I said, do what? And now I'm, I'm 25 years old. And I said, what, do what? He said, these are natives. We are missionaries. I said, well, their Bible says the same as mine. He, he just, he said, I never thought about that. See, we apply the Bible to ourselves, but the Bible is for everyone. And that's why this tonight just thrills me. What you're doing for one more of the languages in the world that have no scripture at all until now. Until now. And there's only less than 1,500 now. And uh, just two years ago, not even two years ago, uh, we declared the 1776 languages left with not one scripture in them. We're going to at least get some of the Bible in by 2020. Do you remember that? And it's coming down so fast, but we've got to speed it up. So as we talk tonight, it's not just about the Bible. I'll, I'll just briefly use the, the, uh, the outline that we, we all know, not all of us, but most of us here. But uh, I want to start with the verse I gave you as I met together with you in, in, in uh, May. And that is... In the book of Genesis, chapter 1, the very first command that you see in the Bible, not the first command that Jesus said in, in uh, Mark chapter, what is it, 12 verses uh, 29 through 31, but this one is the command that was first given to the first two people. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and then manage it. So that, as we follow that, we have to look at, let's say, the number 200,000. What is it that needs to be done to see the 200,000 that is God's heart, according to what we have heard? And this is something that is not big when you talk to the Chinese <laughs> Christians. This, this is, you know, this is 20% of what they're talking about. And as we understand what God is saying, and if that is something that you think, well, it's just a, a pride trip, it's not. I've been, been uh, along this way long enough to know there's no pride in it because the very, very kind of taking on that kind of challenge, you are going to get hit from ways you never thought before. And just as I believe there's a great move of God that has already started that eventually will cover the globe as far as the knowledge of the glory of the Lord that will cover the, the earth as the waters cover the sea. But there's something coming with that persecution. So that will keep you humble no matter how much success, so-called success you have. There'll be plenty of persecution because every inch you take uh, that Satan thinks it's his, he's going to fight for it or one of his henchmen will. Uh, but they only got a third of the, the angels. But don't forget, they are going to be busy trying to defend their territory. And so within that, that understanding, as, as we will, will see the... Uh, let me, let me get some notes up here, or otherwise I'll go too long. I don't ever use notes, but I have found I can shorten it if I do. <laughs> and people have been praying for me to use notes. <laughs> but I go from here... Uh, uh, this week, a little later in the week. First of all, I, I go in the morning back to Kona for just a few days 
this week, and later in the week, I go to uh, Korea. And uh, this will be my third time since April. But uh, we're, we're, I'll tell you why. And we have a very big thing happening there for their uh, July 15th, uh, August 15th, which is their 4th of July. And, and we're having at the Yoido Church, or Pastor Cho, it's what the church that is known in that auditorium because they have multiple auditoriums at the same time. But uh, it's going to be a national thing. And, and so as I, I move around the world constantly, I'll be on all the continents, I guess it is, uh, yeah, in, uh, in about 12 months I'm there. And uh, most of them I've been two or three times during this year. So as I watch the, the, the growth of what the work of God is doing, it's the most exciting time of my entire life. There's such a unity among the leadership of so many missions. It is absolutely amazing. And uh, Bob Creason of Wycliffe and, and uh, Steve Douglas of Crew and, and the various ones, I, I just think about them as some of my dear friends. And there's about 17 large organizations we meet together at least three times a year. And uh, as, as we do, we're praying for one another. And we're ministering to one another. And they, uh, they're sometimes sharing, oh, we just got an amount. We don't know where it's, uh, we need it right now. You need it right now. You can have it. That kind of unity that is going on. And that's really, really important as we understand what multiplication is. Now, multiplication, as we look at the words of God about the Great Commission, let's go over them quickly. Uh, Mark 16, 15, our first verse that we founded YWAM with, go into all the world. Uh, go is a change of location, all the world is geography, and then communicate, preach, publish the good news, and that is communication. And to whom? Every creature, that's demographics. So you have both geographics, demographics, as well as communication and personal involvement. You also go to the Matthew 28, verses, start with 19. You go and disciple all nations. How do you do that? It's baptizo, not bapto, as I talked to you about in May. And baptizo is you soak them. You take uh, a cucumber or a, a turnip, and you pickle it. But that's not like bapto, which is just you, you put vinegar and oil on a salad. And that came from a book just before the time of Christ. So in Greek. So a Greek chef gave us the difference between bapto and baptizo. And most translators didn't know the difference uh, today. And so there, there is a difference. One is you soak nations by teaching them. First of all, teach them who the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because you're doing it in his name. And teach them all the commandments that he gave. So that's discipleship. If you're fruitful, you can then move on to multiply. You move on to multiply by discipling. Darlene and I asked the Lord... <clears throat> this was, I think, uh, 67, 1967 or, and into 68. We were praying, Lord, why can't we get more staff? We're getting hundreds and hundreds, 1,200 at a time, going into outreaches, and we're giving them quick training, and they go and so on. Well, there was a reason for that. If you look on a, on a chart... And you see on a chart, uh, you know, like an engineer would do. There's two, two levels. One is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Zeal. And the other one is one, two, three, four, five through ten. And that's knowledge of God. So I had done a study in uh, graduate school at USC. I had a Christian uh, professor. And I said, I want to uh, see that training is the answer to finish the Great Commission. And, uh, 
And so I studied 72 Bible schools and seminaries in 42 nations, their outcome. And I was so devastated with so many. I found one, for example, I won't tell you where or what, but 100% came to go into the work of God full time. And they were learning theology, that study of who God is. And they came in with great zeal. They were up here about eight or nine. But by the time they went through their studies and got their degree, they were down almost to zero uh, degrees in uh, zeal. And they were about nine according to what they had studied who God is. And I thought, this is terrible. I never want in YWAM. I never want training in YWAM. If that's what happens, you take God out of them and the zeal out of them. And that means God, with all knowledge, has no zeal at all because he knows who he is. Or there's something wrong. And so when God spoke to Darlene and me, we were, at that time, I was in New Zealand. She was in California. We both were called of the Lord to a, day, a week of fasting and prayer. And during that week, we didn't know this. We didn't have cell phones back then. And, and, and the, you know, the air mail was so expensive, you had to send it boat mail, and that, that took a long time. But uh, so we, did, we didn't know until we got back together. And then when we did, we both had been given the same word. And this is what it was. I ended up not finishing that because that would have been an expose on, on that thesis. I did another thesis instead. But, but I, I, it wounded me to see what was happening in so many places that they were studying who God is, theology. And I thought... Maybe I, I wouldn't want to do anything either if I'd have studied that. And uh, so as, as a result, the Lord said, I want you to go to Switzerland. We didn't know one soul. And uh, he said, start a school there. And you're going to have, and he explained to us in a, a modular way, taking teachers that come in and only teach what they have done. Ah, that's where I began to see what was happening. People teaching what they haven't done, even in knowing who God is. Let alone knowing the ways of God. Not just the character of God, not just the will of God, but the character, the will, the ways of God, and God is love. Whatever else they say, God is love. That trumps everything else and no, no uh, pun on the word. And so, as, yeah, <laughs> I tell everybody I'd never vote for Trump to be my pastor. Anyway, <laughs> now you don't know, do you? It's a, it's a secret ballot anyway. But what, what I am saying here, as God wants us to learn about him, but he wants us not just to learn about him. He wants us to know him, and that's the difference. And that's what we're trying to do in our schools, both in the DTS and in those other schools as well that uh, come after that. So understanding who God is, that's good, but know God and make him known. And that's how we got our, our, our uh, slogan that we use. And uh, so then he gave us uh, later on what we call the Christian Magna Carta. And this was just simply dropped into uh, what we did. We gathered, and uh, Leland, you were there, and others. And what we did, we all laid down our titles, our responsibilities before the Lord, not knowing whether he'd let us pick it up again or not. And so as we did that, we went away for 45 minutes, came back, and everybody shared what God had spoken to them. It was so refreshing. It was so, a lot of things new. And when I sat down, I sat down with a yellow pad, and, uh, and I, I just said, Lord, is there anything you'd like to say to me? And 
just like that. He dictated these six points. And so I'll, I'll walk through these six points. And, uh, but first, let me, uh, let me give you a video. Is it a video or is it PowerPoint? On, uh, we were told when we were getting into the Bible movement more to go to 10 world leaders in three week in in uh, three weeks and we were to uh, no no 10 days we were to see 10 world leaders and we had no appointments and they were on three continents so that's what we did so i'm on my way to see the uh, one that is most honored among the orthodox uh, popes and uh, there are several of them and that's the coptic movement. That's the oldest orthodox movement in the world. So that's where we went first because if we could get his blessing on trying to get a Bible to every home in the world, then that would include his people. So we wanted those behind us, not pushing against us. And so while I was in the air, I'd called just before to one of our YWAM leaders there in Cairo. And I said, uh, I'm, I'm coming into Cairo. I'd like to meet with uh, Pope Tuadris II. And uh, if possible, tomorrow. <laughs> Which was Sunday. And so, so arrived and they said, yes. He said he'd be delighted. He gave me at least two hours we could have longer. Let me see pictures here. Can you show me? Oh, yes. He gave this to Darlene. Darlene and David Hamilton were, were with me on this. And so this is Pope Tuadris II. He's the one they tried to kill at Easter time last year. And so next picture, we became friends. And I, I'm, I'm gigging him a little bit like I do Leland. And then next, we took a selfie. <laughs> That's only natural. You know, if you're with the Pope, take a selfie. Let's see another one. Then we went over to England. This is, uh, he's the top man, he's uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury over the Anglicans worldwide. And so as we met with him and explained our cause and so on, I've known him for uh, many, many years, decades. I, I spoke in his church in Liverpool, which is the largest uh, Anglican church in the world. And he had his assistant, his youth, youth uh, minister, introduce me. And the man got up. It's, it's a huge building, almost. It, it covers a huge amount of space. And uh, lots, yeah, it's, it's the biggest in the world for them. And so uh, he said, before the crowd, he said, Lauren, I used to be a YWAMer for 11 years. And I backslid and became a... Uh, an Episcopal, uh, rather an uh, Anglican vicar. And everybody, of course, laughed. And so uh, they were a powerful church, by the way, evangelistic and, and spirit filled, and this amazing uh, uh, man he is. So, anyway, he gave us his blessing, just as Tawadris did. He said, I'll tell all of my people when they get a Bible, and if they already have one, open it and start reading it, but don't ever close it. Just keep reading until you finish and start over again. But uh, so, yes, next picture. So we took a selfie. Anyway, <laughs> then for a pastor over in Rome, he pastors a little church there. I went to him because he has, I, I heard, influence. And... Uh, Let's see who that one was. The next one? Oh, this, yeah, he's a pastor of a little church there in Rome. And uh, so uh, I went to see him, and we gave him the Christian Magna Carta in two languages, and both in Spanish and in English, and one of our artists there in, in Kona did all the artwork for it. And uh, move it on, one more. And so... Uh, we also gave him the source view Bible, and within two weeks, he okayed this one for all Catholics worldwide. <laughs> he's, he's a different man, <laughs> let me tell you. Anyway, next. Yeah, we took a selfie. <laughs> now, we made it. We went to all 10 and three continents 
in 10 days. <laughs> Only God could do that. We, uh, one of our YWAMers from Argentina called him and on his cell phone. He has, they have each other's cell phone numbers. And uh, he, he calls him Jorge, George. And uh, he said, don't call me anything else because we've known him there 25 years. They started praying for him, by the way, in Argentina. When he, they went to him, there's a six or story or so building next to the church. And they said, can we have that, can we rent that uh, one that has a big window about the second floor that overlooks all the government, including the presidential palace, for a 24-7 prayer? He said, yes. And so he rented it to us for, for 22 years. And uh, during that time, he kept coming down and say, pray for me. I need prayer. I need prayer. And uh, always humble, just wanted prayer. They'd lay hands on him, pray, and then the Lord said, I want him to become Pope. So they started praying for him to become Pope. And as they prayed, he went away to, uh, after John Paul II passed away. He went to Rome, came back, he said, I can't, I'm too old. Benedict got it, and so I can't be. They said, no, God said, you're going to be Pope. Now, no Pope has ever resigned at this point, ever, in all of history. And so, as they kept praying, the other pope resigned, and he became pope. And so he sold that room to them as a condo, so the next guy can't take it away from them. <laughs> anyway, so Alejandro asked him, he said, Lauren would like to meet with you. He said, okay, let's do it uh, this Wednesday night. I'll, I'll have more time after I finish my day. Have him come to the uh, Martha house where he lives with 180 priests. And uh, he doesn't go to the other place. And, uh, and so we just found, he said to all of his bishops, when he got them together, he said, I want every Catholic to get a Bible and to read it every day and not put it on a shelf. I want all couples to read it every morning together and parents to read it to their children every night. Then he repeated it. And then he repeated it again. And then he handed them all the Gospel of Mark, and he said, now you guys read, start reading it. <laughs> and, and so uh, then he went out with all the crowd, this was on a Wednesday, and told them all, uh, here's the Gospel of Mark, now start reading the Bible. Then he said to one million of the youth, he met with them in Poland a couple of years ago, and uh, said, my greatest treasure on earth is my Bible. You wouldn't think much of it. It's ragged and worn. But for me, I love my Bible. I'm in it every day. I want you to get one and get in it every day. A million young people. And so as we're watching what was happening in getting the unity of the leadership, then we go, I, we helped kick off. I was down in Brazil as we were going door to door. And somebody says, I'm sorry, I'm Catholic. And he says, so yeah, here's my picture with the Pope. <laughs> he says, you're to get a Bible and you're to read it. Every oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> we never got turned down. Not once, not once. <laughs> and so uh, I was also with up in, in uh, the Ar Arctic part of Norway, and we go going door to door then, and it was cold, man, up there, and uh, I just wanted to get inside. I, that was my motive. The secondary was to get them a Bible, but anyway, <laughs> yeah, I'm, you know, anyway, I found something that is happening that is moving us toward something really important. So as we look at the Magna Carta, if you'll put one up, a close-up of that, the Magna Carta given to us was given to us in the Word of God, and uh, I think you can read that in whatever language that is. Uh, that's, I think that's the, the one we, I just used in Mongolia. Anyway, first of all, everyone needs to hear and understand the gospel. One of the tools God has given us is the Jesus film. Now, the Jesus film portrays visually as they're hearing the word of God, because 83% of it is directly from the book of Luke. So they're getting the Bible. And as they're hearing it in their mother tongue and seeing it portrayed 
it has a tremendous impact. So when you show the Jesus film, one of the other groups that we meet with had taken uh, a Jesus film into an unreached people group. They didn't have anything more than that. That's all they had in that mother tongue. They took it in, showed them the Jesus film. Then they gave their own witness. That doesn't take the place of you going. You have a witness that you can go and say, this happened to me. I know him, so I can pass it on to you. And uh, as, as you do that, then you get a decision from them. And they pray to repent and accept the Lord and Savior and as their personal Lord and Savior. And it's always in that way. Kurios is Lord, 72 times in the Greek and the New Testament, and Savior Soter, 24 times. But together, they are there 16 times together, and it's always Lord and Savior. It's never the other sequence, Savior and Lord. And so you submit, you bow, you repent. That's all a part of him releasing his salvation. And so as we, as we uh, see that happening, we also realize they, they stopped at uh, just over 1,200 languages. And the board said, the others are smaller. Let them learn the local, you know, whatever the market language is. And, uh, and, and so we kind of, you know, we, we get to know them, at least their leadership, and they take it to the board. And I said, yeah, that's right. You tell the board, Jesus didn't really love those people anyway. Over there in that little island, they only have a few people. And they, they say, oh, oh, oh. All right, a little sarcasm helps. And uh, I found a, a few places in the Bible, by the way. And uh, <laughs> it didn't use it much, but it's there. But uh, they said, okay, if YWAM will help us, you have the boots on the ground around the world, you're full-time in 191 nations. Uh, uh, excuse me. Uh, yes, 191. We also teach every day in 97 languages. But we, we are in the places. And they said, if you will help get this out, we will train you. We will equip you. So that's what we've been doing. We sent out our first team a couple of three years ago. And uh, we sent them to Papua New Guinea. They were trained for two weeks only with Jesus film people. And then they were equipped with a backpack and all the machines and everything that they needed and the things that they would leave to show the film after it was over. And so they went in a team of five and in four weeks, they put eight languages into the Jesus film and left it behind and one Half a million people were able to see the Jesus film. One team, two weeks training, four weeks on the spot. You want to get some excitement going? It's amazing what's happening. Well, now they're up to around 1,600 languages, and we're moving fast. But we're, we're switching over to put it into the 1,500 languages that have not one verse of Scripture at all. So at least they'll get the most of the book of Mark, uh, rather Luke. And so as we do this, we're, we're moving them, <coughs> moving our own workers into more and more what you're doing here. And I believe several other places now we're doing this around the world. It's starting to become a moving within YWAM. And as this occurs, understand we can help you get acquainted with and get the training for putting the Jesus film in, let's say, this new mother tongue. Because then they would see and know because he's already translated the book of Luke. And by doing that, you have basically translated the, the uh, film uh, for, for, the, uh, for the Jesus film in that mother tongue. See how it works? One hand watches the other. Now, the, the second part, as we move into the second here, and that's everyone should have a Bible in their mother tongue. By these dates, 2020, Christmas time, we want to have some of the scripture in every language on earth. Get the foot in the door, and then you can get the door open wider. 
And so that's the way we work it. You do that in sales, you know. <laughs> Whatever you're selling door to door, just put your foot in the door, and then, uh, then pretty soon you find yourself in the living room signing the contract. So th this is what we're trying to do with the languages. And as, as we do so, by 2020, we want to give a birthday gift to Jesus for Christmas 2020. You like that? All right. Keep it a secret. It's a surprise for him. <laughs> Good luck <laughs> with omniscience. All right. And so secondly, by 2025, we would like to have as our goal that every language on earth will have a recorded at least New Testament. Now, the others are, are moving with us, so we're not just doing this alone, but we are providing a whole lot of boots on the ground. And uh, so we're, we're working together so we can do that. For example, in the Solomon Islands, there are 67 languages that have, they only have a Bible in one language. That's all. And they don't have it in all the others. So we're starting with the Jesus film there. And SIL has come to us and said, would you help us do this? You, do, you, you guys got so many people. If you could just train them and we'll help you train them. And now they're saying, would you train us? Because we haven't done this before, uh, putting the Jesus film into these local languages. So this, this helps in every way where they don't have training, and we do, we can help them, but they, tra they uh, have the best trainers, and that's how we got started anyway. And so, as we're doing this, we're watching the multiplication. They fix our people with the backpack and the machines and all of that. We pay for the, for, for the air trip and uh, the cost of living there. We, we do that, don't we? And, uh, and as we do so, we're seeing more and more languages, but we want to get the last 1,500 languages in the Jesus film there. They now have an app. And that with that app, you can speed it up faster than our guys did two, three years ago. <clears throat> we also, now as we move into the Bible part, if we have that already, we, when we do the entire New Testament, here's the good news. 30% of the New Testament is quoted from the Old Testament. So now you've already translated part of the Old Testament. Just switch it out of Hebrew. You don't even have to. Just switch it out of your language into the Old Testament in that part. Then add the stories. And as you do the stories, now you've got a whole lot more. Do 105 stories, you've got much of the Bible already. Add Psalms and Proverbs and then fix it up in between. But anyway, we are moving very rapidly. We not only want the Jesus, we not only want the, the, uh, the New Testament by then, but we would also like the first 12 chapters of Genesis. And not only for the origin story, but you're inter introducing in the 12th chapter, uh, Abraham. And Abraham is in the first chapter of Matthew. And they say, who's he? Well, you've already found out because you have the, the Old Testament, see. And so as you understand how the thing is working together and different ones, David Swar and his group now are, are doing just the Old Testament. And they're half, half the time they live in Israel. Their mother tongue is both, both uh, English and Hebrew. And so they're getting that moving. So we're watching all of these things coming together and it just gets more exciting. If you think it's fun to watch baseball at this time or, or soon uh, football or then basketball or hockey or whatever you watch, I can tell you, we are in the most exciting time and doing the most exciting thing the world can ever know because the Bible transforms nations. That's why I wrote the book after I'd gone to every nation on earth and every dependent country, showing what the Bible does when they put it into their basic document, like their constitution and all. And uh, we have a group of lawyers on campus now. They're starting a website for new uh, countries like South Sudan or, or uh, Kosovo or East Timor and others, they're looking for constitutions. Well, we will give them not only the American Constitution and a few others, 
that have been taken 90% from the Bible. But then we'll do it like Legos. We'll say, well, what, what, what do you want? He, well, we want equality for all people. Okay, then, then here's, here's a paragraph on that. Here's a paragraph on women. Here's a paragraph on this and that and the other. And so they put it together. They don't know that it mostly comes 90% from the Bible anyway. It just comes in Legos form. They put the Legos together. Now they have their own constitution. They got to do it themselves. But they were asking questions along that line. We give them biblical answers. Isn't that good? That's another way we're working. Now we also have a new book out. I just showed it to you in May. How many have read uh, We Can Now End Bible Poverty? Okay, let me count. Boy, this is, a, this is, a, this is amazing. Five. Anyway, Six. I'll tell you what, I bought, brought a whole box and I don't want to take it home. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I just got to carry it on the plane again. I, I, I want to get this out. And uh, if you will promise to take it and read it, uh, you can have it for $5. And if you don't have any money, not even for McDonald's, you don't have any money, and you just tell us back there, tell the people whoever has taken money to help, uh, we'll give it to you. But if you don't read it by next week this time, you bring it back and give it in for the base. Okay? Yeah, fair enough? All right. So we got a freebie going there for you, or a $5. And I only have uh, two or three of these books, but you can have them for five. These are $15 books, so I'm, I'm giving you a good deal. But with that, as we move through the Bible... What is needed to complete? There are six steps. One is prayer. God breathed on the scriptures. That's 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. He breathed on all scriptures. Now he wants to breathe as you read it. But we need to pray that the Holy Spirit will come and, and literally cause people to have a hunger for the word. Because you can give them the word and then it'll sit there. But you have, to, you have to pray for the hunger. We need prayer. Secondly, you need translation. And that comes in different forms. One is recordings. Just simply a recording, verbal, orally. And then they can hear it, read it, even if they're not literate. Or if they are literate and don't like to read very much. They like to hear it. And they can do that. And we have many forms of, of devices that they can now use with solar powered and, and, you know, cranked up and so on. There's all kinds of ways now. There's no excuse and we can really get it out. Then there's also uh, the area of written, that is translation like you're doing now. That brings literacy and it brings deeper study of the Bible. And you need both. So by 2033, we're joining with all of the Bible societies and all of the Bible translators. They've all agreed by 2020, 2033, that's 2,000 years after Jesus died, buried, resurrected, gave the Great Commission, ascended, and started in his church 2,000 years before that. And we're celebrating the 2,000th year by having every language on earth in written form as well as recorded form. That's the goal. And they have all agreed on it with the Green family. That's the Hobby Lobby people who have been really supporting a lot of this. I met with Hobby Lobby senior guy. That's his, David Green. He's in his 70s. And, uh, and so he told me, he says, you know, I had to go back to work because of my son's addictions. <laughs> They're addicted on, to the Bible. One of them has built the uh, billion-dollar museum in, in Washington, D.C., and the other one is, is getting Bible translation done and paying uh, all, all kinds of expenses to get that accomplished worldwide in, in all the different languages. So as, as we're watching what's happening, God is undergirding it, even releasing funding and all the rest. We just need to get on board and get moving. Now, the, the third thing after translation is production. You need to print it if it's printed and hard copy, or you need to put it into an app form. What we now have with SourceView Bible and now SphereView Bible, 
because we have had 200 YWAMers that are deep into the Word of God giving uh, almost four years to put every verse in the Bible on family, every verse in the Bible on government, every verse in the Bible on every one of the seven spheres. And uh, so now you can have that. And now it's coming out in five other languages uh, by next month. Uh, it'll be there in, in Thailand. And it'll be in several other languages. So it's in Korean, it's in English, it's in Spanish, it's in Portuguese, and so on. So it'll, it'll be going out in more and more languages because we're getting a new app <coughs> that will allow us to put it into any language on earth. So as soon as a language comes, they can also see every verse of the Bible on the seven spheres. And uh, so that's a help as well. Or you can look at the Bible a billion different ways because there's metadata behind every single word in the Bible uh, with the Source View Bible. It's the first digital on digital platform. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't ask me. I don't know either. But uh, <laughs> I memorize well. Anyway, so as you, as you understand what I'm saying here, there, there, for any word, it's connected behind it with, with 13 to 50 other words. And that gives you a, a, a way to look at the Word of God like you've never thought of before. Just, it's, just, it's just fabulous, actually. I just finished reading the whole Bible on my app. And uh, it, it just, I just had a different point of view with Leviticus and with Numbers and, and, and so on, where I used to skim them. But I really got into it. And I found, wait, wait, this, this, oh, I see what was happening. You know, here these people have been eight, 18 generations. That's 400 years. They have been slaves. All they knew from morning to night was work, 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 work. They didn't know anything except what they were told to do and are given a little bit of food. That was all they got for 400 years. They didn't have a culture. They had a slave culture. They didn't know what beauty was. They never got to wear beautiful things. They never got to sing beautiful songs except quietly. And, uh, and so they had to be taught in a wilderness to get them ready for the promised land. God was giving them a culture. He said, now, now you know, you, you took some of the, you know, beautiful jewelry from the Egyptians as you left. They were glad to give it to you because they wanted to get you out of there. And, and now let's dress up the, the uh, priests with it and the beauty of their clothing and so on, the details of it and everything. Why, they were teaching people the whole tailoring industry. They were teaching them a lot of things. And then you get into numbers and they go over and over the numbers. They had never studied, you know, division or multiplication or even addition and so on, except what they could do on their fingers. You see, they had to have something. And that's how they became the bankers of the world, because they had Numbers, the book of Numbers, and, and so on. That's just part of it. The other thing, the wars, you know, the, the Hittites, the Malachites, they, you know, hit, uh, whatever they are, oh, you know, cellulites. Anyway, whatever it was, they, they had them all. And, but see it as spiritual warfare. Now, when you see this as spiritual warfare, then you'll understand it's there. But it's also discipling nations. He was discipling a nation, not just to have one nation, but all nations can be discipled with the Word of God. So you need the Old Testament. That's the point. And uh, as we, we come to the next uh, area was the area of fellowship. We need to have fellowship. Now, I, I was in 1970, I was down in uh, Papua New Guinea. And they had, the team had started set, uh, five churches at that time. And, uh, and they had one out of the university, two uh, brilliant young leaders, uh, Papuans. And, and they put one over two of the churches, one over three. Now, our most recent time in there, Darlene and I were there a couple of years ago I, for two weeks. And we were doing a DNA there. And a DNA of YWAM is what we call it. And so for leadership development, we had about 200 of them. And, and with it, 
these two pastors came. Now, they haven't been in YWAM. We're interdenominational. We don't keep churches. We, we uh, spin them off either to, into their own denomination or, or to link them with appropriate denominations wherever they are. And so as we, we, we really, they came out and they were so excited to report in. One of them had now over 400 churches. The other had over 600 churches. And they, that's over 1,000 churches in multiplication of churches. We need to have fellowship because you grow faster in fellowship than all alone. You can do it alone. You're in solitary confinement. Go for it. But, uh, but you need to have fellowship, and that makes a huge difference. So as we think of multiplication, you are beginning to see that next point is distribution, so in distribution, they're going to need the word to have the uh, fellowship uh, be the, the uh, place where, where you're cooked <laughs> good and uh, being able to, to fellowship one with another around the word. And then there's accountability. The next one is after distribution. And there are many ways now, including you have uh, celestial, that's through satellite. If you read... Revelation 14, 6, there was a messenger mid-heaven that had the eternal gospel for every person on earth, every nation, tribe, kindred, and tongue. And so you see there, that was 2,000 years ago that was written, but, but still it speaks to us in our day of satellites. And so now, satellites can be used to reach to every device, whether in your cyber or your purse, without going through terrestrial, which is towers, or cyberspace, which is the internet. So you can do all, four, all three of those ways to get a Bible to every home on earth or every individual in the world. Without anybody, no government can stop it. It's just boop, doop, right to your pocket. And all you have to do is say, Yes, I want the film. Yes, I want the book in my mother tongue. That's all. And it has language recognition. So with that, we have all the problems being answered. And uh, that has all happened in just the last 15 years or so. So as we, we look at this and see where we're going, the next is you have to educate them. That is to, to train, to listen, to understand, as they're getting into the Word of God, and then it is engagement. That's where they take it in and make it their own and begin to live it out and to bring it to their nation through the various seven spheres that they're working in. Now, having said that, we move on here to say, how can this be illustrated? And I want to give you two different illustrations. One is through a uh, movie. The other is through a nation. So I, I think I'm going to go for the movie first. Now, I have to declare this, you know, you have to do this for, for certain purposes. I do have uh, what they call, uh, uh, what do you call it? I, I have a... Uh, you know what nepotism is? There's a family member here. So, yeah. And so I will declare that I have, uh, yeah, interest in this, <laughs> in this from my, my son's program, okay? Now, nepotism is okay if you just keep it in the family. But uh, <laughs> my son has just finished a film. It's called Running for Grace. And so he being, it's all been uh, done in Hawaii. It's Hollywood quality. We have there Jim Caviezel, you know him. He, he played the role of Jesus in the, in the uh, Passion of the Christ. And so with this conflict of interest of mine, <laughs> uh, I, I want to promote it a little bit. And he also has Matt Dillon. And it's all about a little boy who is a, he's a child who is illegitimate. And this is 
This is put 90 years ago in history, in the 1920s. And it's on in Hawaii. So everything was filmed in Hawaii. And so I want you to see here a film, if you're ready. Uh, we want to see the film, and it'll be introduced by David Cunningham. <laughs> All right. He's the director. And I'll tell you ahead of time, in the Hawaiian Islands, the, the uh, theaters were so filled, it put him number seven in the nation of the most seats taken, according to you know, per capita seats, uh, in, the, in the theaters there in Hawaii. So uh, as, as a result, uh, it's, it's a big deal when you fill the theaters on the first three nights. And instead, they had to have up to eight showings a day uh, there in the Hawaiian Islands. So let's, let's, let's roll it. This is David Cunningham. Aloha from Hawaii. My name is David Cunningham. I'm the filmmaker behind Running for Grace. I have this amazing legacy that I'm so privileged to, to be a part of. Seven generations of missionaries and ministers on one side of my family, four generations on the other. I grew up surrounded by world changers, people who were gonna change the world at all costs as, as a missionary, as a minister. My parents started an organization called Youth of the Mission, or YWAM, an interdenominational missions organization that is spread all over the world. And I grew up in that mission, traveling the world, seeing amazing people doing amazing things in a hurting world. My calling from a young man was to have a different pulpit, but to have the same message to help shape culture, help change our world. And that, and specifically for me, was through filmmaking. Just gonna have you come to this place here. Right. He's gonna be really yelling at you. And action, go! We need to jump in there and engage. And it's a real privilege to be a filmmaker with so many people being influenced by the entertainment sphere. And this particular film is all about the power of adoption. Adoption is the gospel, and the gospel is adoption. Now this film is an uplifting, feel-good movie, but the themes of identity and adoption is our intent to help shape culture and have people consider this powerful tool. It was a real privilege to work with Jim Caviezel. Not only is he very talented as an actor, but he's very passionate about his beliefs. And one of those things is about adoption. He and his wife, Carrie, have adopted children from China themselves. And so the script really resonated with him. I think it's a film that will really resonate with the people. It has great redemption to it. A very practical way that we are using this film to get the message out about the power of adoption is championing those who have already adopted. So for example, in our premiere at Honolulu, we had 160 families who have adopted come and we were able to love on them, celebrate them, have them walk the red carpet. Just floored and uh, overwhelmed by the beauty and the glory of this film and even the message, you know, with uh, fathering and adoption. We are also seeing the impact of this film with youth at risk. At one of our premiere screenings, a large group of, of kids from the Section 8 housing projects in Honolulu came, and it was an honor to sit amongst them and hear the hooping and hollering about this concept of, of identity and overcoming, and in spite of broken families, and in spite of hardship, in spite of racism, and they had an amazing night, and we were so privileged and honored to witness and how the youth ministers afterwards were able to tie in a message about identity and the gospel. That girl was grace. But let me tell you the reality of life. God will never leave you, and he'll never let you struggle. It's your job to run to grace. That lost family is a terrible thing. Running for Grace is set in the 1920s in the U.S. territory of Hawaii. During that time, there was laws about racial integrity where it was actually illegal to adopt children of mixed ethnicities. 
Joe is half Caucasian, half Japanese, and rejected by both communities. A new doctor comes to town, played by Matt Dillon, and takes the boy under his wing, being a de facto father. Eventually, that outcast boy becomes a pillar in the community, a leader in the community. Um, actually, I'm adopted. I think it just really touched my heart because it's something I felt like I can relate to a lot. And it was just incredible to be reminded of how we are adopted into God's family and also feeling like um, just being able to represent God in real life. So it was awesome. <laughs> We've already been able to see ways that this film can practically help in the themes of adoption and identity. This film is meant for a wide commercial audience. It's meant for a lot of people to see. Now, we don't necessarily want to be preaching to the choir, but we do need the choir's help. And this is one of those films and one of these subject matters that the church has had real leadership in, in the concept of adoption. So would you please consider getting behind us? You can see on this package a myriad of ways that you can do it. Spread the word. Champion fostering and adoption in your community. And we hope that this movie will be a good tool for that. Right after this, check out our trailer, and we'll see you at the movies. This is the trailer. What's with that kid? He just showed up out of nowhere. Where's your parents? My boss family. It's a terrible thing. But you gotta keep on going. All right, kid, come on. You can live with me. I'm the new doctor for the plantation. If any of you are sick or get hurt, you just see Joe, and he'll come get me. You know, Joe, you seem pretty smitten with the big man's pretty daughter. Miss Grace has hurt her ankle. Miss Grace? Send that boy away! They jeopardize your entire future. What are you thinking? They're bringing in another doctor. When are you going to learn to trust me? The doc asked me to buy and drop off. That won't be necessary. Miss Grace is now under the care of a proper physician. You and the doc may take care of the uh, Orientals and the other laborers. Do you have a crush on the Danielson's daughter? I got something for you. It's beautiful. <laughs> Get your hands off her. You don't even have a last name. I have been trying for years to adopt this kid. This is about a boy who deserves a future. Shorten the distance between the mountain and the ocean. Stay like this forever. It's opening on the August 17th uh, in about 10 major uh, areas. One is Dallas. It's really in Garland, Texas area. And, uh, and we, if we fill the theaters the first two, three nights, that's Saturday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, that boop uh, pumps it up, and then everybody wants to see it nationwide. And then it'll go on to Netflix and so on. But this is about adoption. And that's what the gospel is. You're adopted through Jesus Christ because he was adopted by Joseph or he would have no genealogy back to Abraham or Adam. And his is an adopted genealogy. Ours is adopted, but we do it through Christ to Abba Father. And so it's really uh, about adoption, but practically as well, there's 100,000 children right now wanting to be adopted. They have no last name. And God puts the name, his name, in the Lamb's Book of Life because we've been adopted into the family. So we may have a new name up there. However, you notice with the little boy, if you read the book, uh, 
Heavens for Real or saw the movie. He, when he came back, he said, I saw my older sister. They said, son, your older sister is here. My, my son knows his family. He coached them on that film. And so he, they said, your, your, your older sister is here. He says, no, no. The one she said, you, she died in your tummy, mommy. Now, they didn't tell a three-year-old about uh, a miscarriage. But here he comes back. And then she, the mother asked, what was her name? She said, you haven't named her yet. That was a new thought to me. And I think if uh, we would start naming before they're born, maybe that would make it easier not to yeah, do away with them. And so as we, we understand what, what God is saying to us uh, through this, we want to see those 100. All it would take is 100,000 churches. There's 49,000 Hispanic churches that are evangelical Spanish-speaking churches in America. If, so think of all the churches we have, all the different kinds. 100,000 churches adopting one in one of the families. You don't adopt them as a church, but one of the families. Think what that would be. Think what you did here. You've got 100 kids adopted right here out of YWAM and Father's Heart. And so as we, we see what God can do through us, through this film. Because after the film, if we, if we buy out one of the uh, theaters, it takes for a red carpet uh, opening, it'll take uh, $5,000. And that allows all parents and their children that have adopted someone in their, their family to come free. We, we raise the money to, to highlight and to thank them. And a lot of you, how many have adopted here in, in this room? So all of you would get to go free because somebody else pays the bill, right? But don't, don't, don't uh, push it aside. We want to do that in order to honor you, in order to then stand up at the end of the film. Somebody will stand up and say, this is how you can adopt. And this is 100,000, and we're wanting to do this. So it's really, yes, it's a love story, but it's really the story of giving someone a name. And when he gets that name, he gets to marry the girl. That's, he's running for grace. And, and you'll see the guy, what happened is, is the guy started, this is from the, the, uh, the gang hair area of Honolulu. And these are all rough and tumble kids that have, you know, grown up in difficult areas. And the guy that brought them all, and they got all free, free tickets because they were from broken homes and so on. And, uh, but he said to them, this is not just talking about grace, the girl. This is the grace of God. Now, you have to make it your grace by making it. You know, he was preaching right there in the lobby of the, of, of the theater after they'd seen the film. And it just softened their hearts. So it's going to have, according to how much we do about it, it's going to have an impact spiritually there. Now, that, uh, so we're going to ask you, we have buses outside to take you, to, not, not quite. Anyway, we'd like for you to go by bus to Garland and fill the place. And then we'll also be trying to raise the money. I'm, I'm trying to get it out of Leland's pocket, but he's pretty tight. <laughs> not really. He's one of the most generous guys I know. Anyway, but uh, as, as we endeavor to see what, what, uh, what we can do about it, and then if you want to go another 5,000, we could actually get another studio. He, David thinks he, that Fox will allow them to distribute another one, and, and that's in Tyler itself. So we could fill up two, but it's the same weekend. That's the key. And so with that, uh, I'll leave it to you. And you, you what's, do we have our contact yet? We're working on it. So uh, you see Chris. And uh, he'll give you the contact on how to do this, both in YWAM and out. Finally, and this is finally, just like Paul said three times, finally. And uh, in one of the books. Anyway, I want to end with Mongolia. I spent a week there in, in April. And uh, we had 600 leaders from the, house, from the churches, pastors, missionaries, and... Uh, and 
during that time, four days we had with them. Then I met with the YWAM leaders, and then uh, I spoke in churches on Sunday up to, I think, uh, many hundreds of people. I couldn't help but remember when Darlene and I first went to Mongolia in 1988, there was one known Christian in the nation, and he was in prison. And so here we have 650 churches in that nation. The first two were started by YWAM teams from Sweden. They started them not in Ulaanbaatar, the capital, but the next two major cities. And those are now running up several hundred each in those churches. I met a YWAM team leader. They've started 35 churches, that, that team alone. Another one started 20 churches and so on. And so we're in the first generation of Christianity. No one's older in Christ as a Mongolian than just 25 years. And so as you see where we are, they are really raring to go. And they want to see everybody reached. And so I've uh, been talking to, I, I better uh, maybe telescope this a bit. We're going to have teams, teams of three to five at the most, but three. And we need a thousand teams of three. One Mongolian Christian young person, and young is <laughs> anyone under 40, but, uh, but we're also going to get one from Korea. They have an affinity. It's very important. That's why I'm going uh, back to Korea again. I'm trying to get a thousand young people to sign up for this this summer. And they are also going to go through a DTS and we're going to train them what to do and what to say this summer. And then the other one is from other nations around the world. So it's a thousand. And I wanted to give you a heads up because I'm going to share this in Thailand with our 4,000 people gathered there. And we're going to, we're going to get the rest of the 1,000 that I don't get out of here. But I think we'll get 500 here tonight. Anyway, I, I'm, I'm always pressing. Anyway, as, as uh, we go, this is how we're presenting it. We have some that are going to the top people in the nation, including the president and, and the executive branch, the Supreme Court and the, and the, uh, the legislators, and the eight, 19 governors, both in the countryside as well as the precinct governor, governors in, in the city. I have, the, have one of the cards of the deputy govern, governor over the whole city, and she's a wonderful Christian. And so as... Uh, as we contact them, we're offering their children that are senior, when they get to seniors in high school, would they like to come to America as a, an exchange student and stay in the homes of Christian families in the church and then help them get into a four-year degree program in university. So several pastors are starting to respond to this, even here in Texas, to say, we'll take them in our homes. So in doing that, you've got them five years, and you're discipling them. And this has been done for, uh, for the nation of Vietnam. And literally in Vietnam, the ones going back, they're fluent in English. They've got their degrees in university in America, and they're going back. And they are literally the children of the leaders of that nation. And they're all born again, almost without exception. There's a few of them that haven't said yes. But it, it is so, such amazing. I went to one church that, where they did this. And I was in four services Sunday morning. And uh, it's a large church, many thousands. And uh, Southern Baptists right there in Dallas area. And they had every... Every service was filled with whole rows, uh, not rows, they were with the families, but whole uh, numbers of Vietnamese young people praising God. By the way, it's a charismatic church too. Hey, that's secret, don't tell. Anyway, as you, as you see what is on our plate, we're calling it a international youth cultural exchange tour. Visit, visit rather. An international youth exchange visit. Now, in Asia, and Leland knows this well, you take a, a gift and you give it to the people who invite you into their home. And so we are coming with gifts. And the gift, of course, is a hard, hard copy of the Bible. 
it's a Jesus film, you know, tucked away. We're working with Jesus film people. Uh, they just put out a million of these with the Greek Orthodox uh, churches uh, and their pope there in Greece. And uh, they had, a, for every everyone, a million of them they got out. We're, do, we're doing that for every home in the nation. So we have a thousand teams and each team must go to uh, uh, 600 homes, 300 in the countryside and 300 in the city because it's split half and half those that live in uh, Yulun Bator and those that live in the countryside or, or the smaller cities. So as they go, the first thing they do, they have this gift ready and they hold it. And uh, on it, they will also have SD cards and they will have not only the printed Bible on it, the Jesus film, but they will have a sound track as well for, for the uh, oral Bible. They will also have hymnals and songs of praise and worship in their mother tongue. They will also have several things anyway, teachings and so on. All of that will be on an SD card. Now with an SD card, they cost $4 each. So we've got machines that duplicate them, but they, it, it's costly. So what we now have this week, it's being released by one of our friends, David Pulaski over in, in, in uh, Atlanta. And he has now invented a deal where we can put it on your, your smartphone. And everywhere you go, it will ping all the smartphones within a matter of a radius of several feet around you. And you, they will get a download in their mother tongue, either Mongolian or Kazakh. Those are the two languages of the nation, plus two little small tribes in the north. And so as, as we do that, we can literally give away the Bible everywhere we go for those that have a smartphone. So, and then we tell them, now, you give it to everybody else. And so it's free of charge. They get the whole thing. Boom, boom, boom. It's free, except for, you know, just the first first uh, SD card. And so as we're doing all of this together, we go into the home and say, would you tell us about your, your culture? And uh, we, we've come to learn. And you listen to their culture, and in it they'll tell you, well, I'm Buddhist, or I'm left over from this, you know, the Soviet Union days, which I'm an atheist. And uh, as they talk about it, or out west, it's the Muslims. And as they say this, you're, you're making note of this, what they are, and uh, mentally and maybe recorded, and the GPS of that home. And we have someone, a YWAMer, that is getting her PhD doing a spiritual mapping of the whole nation. So we get that over to her. And so they literally know the whole nation. But as they give theirs, then we know and say, this is an exchange program. We're going to talk to you about the, all of us are part of a Jesus culture. And then we tell them about Jesus. And at the end, they're offered a, an alpha course. And if they take the alpha course, or, and we have two other courses too that we're offering, depending on which works best. And, and at the end of that, they get a certificate. And then if they ex have accepted Jesus, we have a local pastor that will baptize them, and then their study group becomes a church. So it's, it's complete. After that, by September of next year, all of this is in the summer of this year. You don't want to go there in the winter door to door. Anyway, I've been there in the winter. And uh, then after that, we bring in, like Daniel Kalinda has said, I'll come, and uh, Impact World Tour and many others, they'll do the big big events afterwards because we don't want to have the walls go up from the Buddhist leaders and, and the other leaders. Instead, we want them to accept us as, as we are and on level ground. Can it be done? And how many of you think that you'd like to be a part of this? I'm not saying you got to pray about it, of course. But how many would like to be a part of something like this? Would you like to? I've been there more than uh, three times. And so we, we can see this done. And we need to get uh, YWAMers from all parts of the world to be participants in this. And I'm giving you this first. And Thursday night, I'm giving it to Kona. And then I'm giving it in, uh, in, in uh, Korea. And then I'm giving it in Thailand. So uh, get on board. Amen? All right. 
Thank you for being so kind and patient and gentle with me.